The wide open spaces of Nevada are the perfect testing ground for the U.S. military's top secret weapon systems and aircraft. So it's not unexpected that people who live there often report seeing unidentified flying objects. But the UFOs that have been sighted most recently are unique. You can see that it was definitely a spheroid shaped object and that it was surrounded by this very energetic field that would lag behind the maneuvers that it would make. We stopped on this ridge and my partner looked at me. His eyes were as big as fish bowls, and he motioned for me to look back over our shoulders to the east. I can't say for sure what we saw was of this earth. Area 51, Dreamland, Groom Lake. This UFO rich area has many names, unless you talk to the military. Despite high-level leaks about top-secret aircraft testing here, with code names like Aurora and Black Manta, the Pentagon continues to issue their standard denials, even to Congress. Every time uh, that there's a story about Aurora or the TR-3A Black Manta in the popular science or the New York Times or something else, Congress calls the Pentagon on the carpet and says, what's the deal? They want to know if these planes exist. And every time they've asked about those planes, they've been told there is no such thing. The military's established a pattern of denial concerning these uh, highly capricious wild aircraft beginning in the late 50s and continuing to this day. The pattern of denial started with the U-2. In the 50s, sightings of strange cigar-shaped craft were followed by leaks about a new spy plane codenamed U-2. The military denied the existence of any such plane until Francis Gary Powers was shot down over Russia in a U-2. The pattern continued in the 1960s with the SR-71 Blackbird, in the 70s and 80s with the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber, and now in the 90s, it's happening again. There are new sightings of disc-shaped craft, new leaks suggesting the discovery of an anti-gravity device, and the same old denials. There's a certain conceit, I think, among journalists that, well, if it's real, if it's true, we can get it because Washington, the government, the Pentagon, they all leak like a sieve. Well, that may be the attitude in journalism, but if you ask military folks, they will tell you secrets can be kept, secrets are kept. Many believe the secrets are kept here at this supposedly non-existent Nevada military base. Rumors suggest that anti-gravity technology being used here was actually recovered from an alien spacecraft. I think there's a strong possibility that we have recovered some sort of alien technology and are trying to incorporate that into military programs. In an attempt to penetrate the security net around Area 51, investigators Michael DiGregorio and Roger Johnson peddled a backcountry route. Suddenly, a series of red-orange objects flared out across the sky. They started at a great height, seemed to descend, and then flared out. Uh, it was startling. Then a series of uh, silver pewter flashes went directly across the horizon at terrific speed. One of these silver flashes went directly up into the air. The bottom one seemed nearly to hug the ground. Did Di Gregorio and Johnson witness the super secret testing of a new kind of aircraft? In fact, someone did think they saw too much. As they returned to base camp, they were detained by a security patrol that seemed to be protecting more than just a stretch of arid landscape. Boom. Had lights come on, there was an M16 pointed at us, and here we were faced with a life and death situation. But we also knew that we had crossed the line back into public domain, and therefore, we were safe. Three months later, in the same area, independent investigator Mark Farmer saw the same orange-red UFOs. He had a camera and captured these images on film. As an aviation expert, Farmer was stunned. I saw the object exhibit entirely unconventional flight characteristics. At times, it would wobble around in the sky and appear very unstable. At other times, it would be in a rock-hard hover. It was an oblated sphere, multicolored, crimson on bottom, blue-green on top, much brighter than anything else in the sky. Is this photographic evidence of the military's latest experimental aircraft? The answer isn't likely to come from the Pentagon. Let me put it this way, I, I don't think the military has any credibility with the public in terms of its denials of this program or that program. They've denied the U-2 existed, they denied the SR-71 existed, they denied working on stealth. All of those programs suddenly were unveiled. The only information at this point comes from leaks within the government structure. 
Bob Lazar, an aerospace engineer formerly assigned to Area 51, claims the government possesses at least nine disc-shaped alien craft currently warehoused in Nevada. I was part of a back engineering group, and our job was basically to look at these recovered disks, and I say recovered because I don't know really where they came from, whether they were given to us, we found them, shot them down, who knows what. But uh, our group basically was to back engineer them, which means to start with a finished product and go backward and see how it was fabricated uh, and try and duplicate some of that technology with earthly materials. To me, Bob Lazar is credible. Over the past couple of years, I've spoken to literally dozens of people who have worked at that facility out there in Nevada. I think the technology at Area 51 originally came from somewhere else. They were looking at something that, uh, as far as Bob is concerned, didn't come from this planet, and they were trying to figure out how it worked. John Andrews is also considered a reliable source for information about government projects. He has an amazing track record for revealing aircraft projects before their official unveiling. He's not a military officer, nor an aerospace engineer. He's a product designer for a toy company called Testor, and he can't keep a secret. Secrecy is used oftentimes to hide the details of the funding and the size of the program. More often than not, it doesn't hide a real, true technological secret. The Pentagon was not amused when Testo released a replica of the F-117A stealth fighter before it was officially known to the public. The recent release of their Project Aurora model is also making waves. Why is a toy company the public's best source for information about military projects? They have sources throughout the military, they have sources in companies like Lockheed and Northrop, and they get bits and pieces of information from here and put it all together. With such a remarkable track record, what's next on the tester drawing board? John Andrews says it will be this, a UFO replica called the Sport Model. In the case of the UFO model, we've made every effort to make it correct and to make it accurate. We've made every effort to find out the best information on the subject. We went to people who said that they have worked on the craft. Could the sport model really be the next step forward in military aircraft design? Tester says yes, and the experts are listening. The Tester Corporation has been very lucky in terms of building models that suddenly become real planes, but it's not luck. Now they're telling us that they believe that Flying saucers at Area 51 are a real possibility. This model may be the very, very first authentic plastic scale model kit of something that was designed and built and flown from another planetary system. Uh, I cannot say that that is absolutely certain, but there is that possibility. According to the U.S. government, Area 51, a super secret military testing ground, does not exist but they're buying up all the land around it anyway. Since the 1950s, the United States Air Force has allegedly operated a top secret military testing facility in this dry lake bed in the Southern Nevada desert. Codenamed Area 51 and Dreamland, the base has long been rumored to be a center for black project research. Now, the US government has begun seizing all the land around a base that does not officially exist. It is a paradox that has not escaped the attention of dedicated ufologists. This withdrawal was intended to obscure the secret base. In fact, it had the opposite effect. Everyone's heard of Area 51 now because they took this public action. Glenn Campbell is a self-described Area 51 activist and government watchdog. He believes the military has initiated the purchase of land where civilians have taken unauthorized photographs. Freedom Ridge and White Sides were places where the average citizen could go up and see this non-existent facility. It's 13 miles away, you can't make out a lot of detail, but you can see hangars, you can see the longest runway in the world. The reason they gave for this withdrawal is they needed it for the public safety. They said they needed it to keep people from being hit by airplanes up there, which was plainly ridiculous. And as the outside perimeter of Area 51 widens, so does the facility's mysterious security net. When Glenn Campbell led a sightings investigative team to the new boundary, one of the infamous white Jeep Cherokees driven by men in camouflage fatigues appeared on the ridge. Okay, we're at the new border, uh, White Sides Mountain. 
used to be able to drive all the way up this road another mile and then another mile hike to the top of that peak where you had a very clear and simple view of the base. Uh, we've got the same new signs here. If you cross here, they can kill you. This is as close as you're ever going to get to dreamland. The government says it doesn't exist, but they will shoot to kill if you cross the line. This is here to keep the secrets of dreamland locked out of sight security perimeter with parabolic microphones, electronic sensors, and a heavily armed security force. Inside the compound, some of the world's most closely guarded secrets. Certainly, the next generation of military research and development. But some people believe there's even more. U.S.-built flying saucers using extraterrestrial technology. The research allegedly is based on alien spacecraft and cadavers stored in a man-made cavern deep below Area 51. It's the biggest story in the universe if it's true. It's the biggest story in human history if it's true. George Knapp is a TV anchor turned investigative journalist who's been researching Area 51 for years. Area 51 has been the location of choice for our blackest projects, the most secret projects our U.S. military has going. The U-2, the SR-71, uh, stealth fighter, uh, all, all sorts of CIA, monkey business. It, it's been the spot. I've interviewed people who worked there in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s who have told me basically the same story, that there are craft up there, that they're disc-shaped, classic flying saucer-looking vehicles. They don't know exactly where they come from. I realize most of it is complete nonsense, but there seems to be a core of inform information that's intriguing. The years of hard work paid off. Recently, Knapp acquired an extraordinary document, a document so secret it has never before been seen in public. It's the government's official handbook for Area 51, a thick publication for a place that doesn't exist. I got the manual through an independent source. Uh, why do I know it's real? I can't tell you. It's a detailed guide that explains the facility building by building, including the mysterious Hangar 18, the place rumored to hold a 10-story underground facility packed with every piece of alien technology ever recovered. It says that it's not to be removed from the base, uh, but somebody clearly removed it. It lists, uh, in the case of an intrusion, where the security forces are supposed to go, what their priorities are. It gives us an insight into what goes on at the base that we've never had before. There are so many UFOs spotted near Area 51 that a year ago, the state of Nevada renamed nearby Interstate 375 the Extraterrestrial Highway. The secret base has even found its way into popular culture with a video game. In the absence of real information, outlandish rumors multiply like weeds. The stories in the past dealt with that they were here eating abducted children and, and genetically engineering AIDS and all sorts of wild things. But when you dig down deep, there is a small percentage of these stories from credible people who have claimed to work on saucer programs that um, they're not so easily dismissed. Until recently, the many Area 51 watchers could hike up a hill called Freedom Ridge and look down into the Groom Lake bed with its six-mile runway and enormous aircraft hangars. But that's no longer possible. Uh, our government has seized 4,000 acres of land strategically located around the base so that American citizens can't look down on it. Yet, we've signed this thing called the Open Skies Treaty that allows any signatory nation in the world to fly over this and take all the pictures at once. Uh, who's the enemy? What happens if you decide to drop in on the good folks of Area 51? We decided to find out. Our guide, astronomer and author, Chuck Clark. We're going to go uh, east up Highway 375 for about 19.8 miles till we get to a dirt, ro dirt road up there. And uh, then we're going to go 14 miles off-road back to the Area 51 main entrance. For certain, we'll find security forces watching us. It was dark when we arrived at the ridge closest to the installation. Still 11 miles away from the base, Clark has been down this road many times before. Now he believes we've been spotted by government security. 
Right now, there happens to be a white Jeep Cherokee up on top of the hill ahead of us, about a quarter mile away up there watching us. He has uh, capabilities to uh, use a parabolic mic, which is highly accurate, up to in excess of a half a mile. Very likely, he's listening to us and hearing us as, uh, as clear as, as anyone would standing right here. Our night vision gear allowed us to see the elaborate security system. Signs warned us that the guards were authorized to use deadly force. And then, out of nowhere, we were confronted. Now they're going to shine their little spotlight around on us. What are they doing right here? What are they trying well, to do? Uh, maybe they thought they'd intimidate us away by coming up and shining bright lights on us. Uh, if we were to take one step across that line, they'd be very happy to come up and put a gun in our ear and talk to us a lot. It's a matter of, of playing cat and mouse with them. Yeah, we won this little skirmish. Yes, yes, yes. They'll regroup and they'll come back and, and maybe try another one. Once you've covered this story, you don't go back to covering City Hall. Uh, our leading cutting edge physicists are talking about parallel universes, uh, alternate dimensions. Area 51 is sort of like Brigadoon, that mythical city that uh, appears out of nowhere. You go up there to see what you want and you see it. Uh, the reality of it is, uh, we don't know exactly what they're saying. It is located 90 miles north of Las Vegas. Some call it Area 51. Others ominously call it Dreamland. But everyone calls it Off Limits. Every day, an estimated 1,500 people commute to Area 51. Few stay overnight. Sworn to secrecy, they're expressly forbidden to talk about what they do when they arrive. There is a reason for this intense secrecy, and that reason can be seen in the skies above the base. But some employees have broken their vow of silence and talked about Area 51, and their accounts defy belief. Well, it was saucer-shaped, uh, kind of rounded on the bottom. Uh, they were pretty prevalent at the test site during those years. We decided to conduct our own investigation of Area 51. If these rumors are true, then the military might be involved in a secret research program of staggering implications. Congressman Jim Bilbray is a member of the Armed Services Committee which oversees the base. That much we know. More than that, he won't say. You've been there? Yes. Can you tell us anything you've seen there? No, I cannot. In order to get a closer look at Area 51, we assembled a well-equipped strike team. Among them was Glenn Campbell, an investigator who believes that secrecy and democracy don't mix. This is the sort of, of mystery that Sherlock Holmes would be interested in. If there are UFOs there, by shaking the secrecy tree, they might fall out. Agent X has scouted Area 51 before, and he knows we have to be prepared. We've got a plethora of gear. We've got night vision gear. We've got extreme telephoto lenses. We've got uh, a spy cam. And uh, we've got other bits and pieces of stuff I think that'll give us the edge. Agent X is a self-proclaimed expert in covert weapons programs. Concerned about the security of our operation, he asked that our initial meeting take place on a busy street in Las Vegas. It was there that he first showed me photographic proof of Area 51's existence. There's an enormous facility out there, uh, and it does exist. I mean, I've taken the pictures of it. And something that, that stinks, for the most part, is going on there. With Agent X as our lead guide, we assembled a crew of photographers, cameramen, and off-road drivers to take us within hiking distance of Area 51. First, we headed north to our jumping off point. After a three hour drive in 120 degree heat, Agent X gave us our orientation briefing. This road, Highway 375, is often referred to as either America's alien highway or the loneliest highway in America. Tonight, we're gonna to be going to a mountain just to the left there called Freedom Ridge. 11 miles past there is Dreamland. Our final outpost was the small town of Rachel, this would be our last chance to get supplies before we headed into the deep desert. After we arrived, Glenn Campbell took us into his Area 51 research center, Hi, Glenn, where he gave us a more detailed briefing on what we would soon encounter. This whole area of the military border and adjoining public lands are patrolled by anonymous patrols, anonymous security personnel in camouflage fatigues without insignia, driving unmarked government vehicles. It's very hard to sneak in undetected simply because there's so many eyes out there. 
Although Area 51 is located on Groom Lake, officially, there is no Groom Lake. Groom Lake was on USGS maps uh, up until the 70s when the government actually removed it from the, from the maps. It's sort of like those Russian cities that, that don't exist. Uh, in this very old map, we do see an airstrip here. We see, we see roads for the Groom Lake base. And in later versions of this map, this airstrip has vanished. After leaving Rachel, we journeyed over a few miles of paved road, and then our four-wheel drives took over. Even for experienced off-road drivers, getting close to Groom Lake was not easy. Finally, we set up a base camp in a hidden valley. As we waited for nightfall, I asked Agent X about our target. What goes on in there? What I think goes on out there is, is a great deal, much more than people think. I think as an operational base for advanced and exotic weaponry and, and technologies that we've developed. Um, and also a wide range of aircraft are being tested out there. There's many stories that somehow or another these advanced articles that we are making are hybridized, that they're both advanced terrestrial technology and with an infusion of off-worldly stuff that we found in recovered saucers or whatnot. For obvious reasons, the government refuses all comment. The only thing they will say is that uh, that is part of the Nellis Range and that there is a sensitive military installation out there. But they don't say that there's a 35,000 foot runway. They don't say that there's hundreds of thousands of square feet of hangar space. Uh, they don't say any of that. We've reached the last leg of our journey. The four-wheel drives have taken us just about as far as they can. It's sunset now, and Agent X will take us by foot to Freedom Ridge. We'll be there by nightfall. This could be the last time anyone will ever make that trip. It was a long hike to the last vantage point on public land from which to view Area 51. Ironically, it's called Freedom Ridge, but it won't be free much longer. The Air Force applied to the Bureau of Land Management to withdraw 4,000 acres of public land for exclusive military use. The problem is the Air Force isn't acknowledging the real reason that they're taking this land. Obviously, they want to keep people off this land so they don't see what's going on down at Area 51. Before making our final ascent, we sat down for a delicious meal of Army rations. Well, it's just awful. <laughs> Keeps you alive. By now, security guards are aware that we're here. We're just about to cross the hill into Freedom Ridge. About 12 miles down into the valley, we should be able to see the secret city, Dreamland, the military base that doesn't exist. The base is just right over this hill here. There it is. From 12 miles away, it looks like a small town. But remember, this town doesn't exist. These remarkable daylight photographs show the real face of Dreamland. At the south end of the base, there's the area where the two explosion-proof buildings are. Uh, a little further north than there is Hangar 18, um, the big enormous hangar that is suspected to be the mate demate facility. As you go a little further, you come to four large hangars that are the red hat hangars, where we keep um, ex-Soviet and Russian and Chinese and other people's stuff for foreign material evaluation. The term itself may be George Knapp has extensively debriefed people who actually worked at the base. They told him that a lot more is being tested at Area 51 than just sophisticated spy planes. Sure. Um, people who have seen disc-shaped craft hidden in hangars, <clears throat> people who have seen these things test-flown, people who say they've seen them in underground facilities, both at Groom Lake and at Papoose Lake, uh, people who tell incredible stories about what this technology is capable of, people who say they've been taking it apart to figure out how it works, and that the science, for all intents and purposes, is, is the equivalent of magic compared to where our science is. A physicist who worked at Area 51 allegedly told his former assistant an even more bizarre story. He said there had been an alien, or he didn't call it an alien, but he said a, a small body creature, is what he, the term he used, that had uh, 
survived that Roswell crash. And I said, what is he? Where is he? Or what happened to him? He said, well, that they, as far as he knew back then, they took him out to Area 51. I suspect that with this whole UFO question, the government probably had legitimate reasons for, for maintaining secrecy in the beginning. Something falls out of the sky, you don't know what it is. Something is buzzing around your planes, it can outmaneuver anything you've got, you don't know what it is. You don't make an announcement like that to the public. I figure that they were going to study it for a while until they figured out what it was. Then over the years, so many lies had been told, so much money had been diverted from other programs uh, to maintain the secrecy. Uh, so many lies had been told not only to the American public but to Congress that there was no way to come out with it. I can deny that, and, and I can tell you right now, that I have never seen anything that resembles anything that's alien. Uh, flying saucers, uh, secret underground caverns, uh, whether or not there's some facility up there that I've never seen, I can't tell you that. This area is as big as the state of Maryland or Virginia. Without breaching Area 51's security, it's impossible to know exactly what is going on behind the barbed wire. But Encounters was able to create this computer simulation from a composite of Russian satellite photos, maps acquired from inside sources, and ground reconnaissance photos. For the first time, we can see what Area 51 really looks like. Warning, you entered a restricted area. Deadly force is authorized. Well, I know uh, what I've been told by people who have been inside and have, and have worked there is that there are legitimate national security things going on. It's still a, an ugly world. We still have enemies. Even though it's not a strategic enemy anymore, we still have enemies out there. I, I think uh, people would be a lot more uh, willing to go along with the land grab, willing to go along with pretending the base doesn't exist if, uh, you know, if they were just open up a little bit and be honest about it. I think the problem, again, of Department of Defense is that there is more than one facility out there. And there are some facilities you know about, and I guarantee you there's some facilities you don't know about. Then, at 4 a.m., we were detected by base security. Keep moving through. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Go, 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 go. My opinion is that involved in the excessive secrecy is a lot of money that in some reports, and most recently, the Federation of American Scientists have come out and said that it's possible as much as 40% of these programs is spent on secrecy. Obviously, all our potential enemies know about Groom Lake. There are satellite images that are widely available. There's uh, news reports on Groom Lake. The only people this base is being kept secret from are the American people. I think you're playing with fire. They knew you were up there, and they immediately had to stop doing whatever they were doing and, uh, and move everything into hangars or camouflage it. And then when you went back down, they'd start up again, working on what they were working on. 